Uh, oh, recording in progress. Let's... Right, that should be it, I think. Got my first slide and my laser pointer. Good. Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> We're all there. Right. Um, this talk is going to be about a gentleman called Cornelius Henderson, painter of portraits. That's how he was referred to by Joseph Williamson. Cornelius Henderson, painter of portraits. He did other things, but he was a painter of portraits. So this gentleman, uh, I want to talk about how um, how he uh, interacts with uh, Joseph Williamson. They were great friends in one respect, but uh, there, was a, there was some funny things going on between them, and I'll relay something of it. Uh, so as far as I know it, um, most of the facts that I have have come from our great researcher, Don Hyam. And um, he tells me that Cornelius Henderson came to Liverpool around 1820. Um, he was born in Lancaster, and uh, he was the son of a shoemaker, I believe. And um, his father was uh, a bit of a painter. I'm going to have to do an awful lot of reading here because I can't remember it all. Um, he practiced painting um, landscapes in oils, and it seems as if Cornelius inherited some of his father's talents, and uh, he may have had some training in art while he was in Lancaster. But he eventually decided to come to Liverpool. He obviously found that he had a, um, a talent for uh, portrait painting. And uh, in, in those days, before the days of photography, I suppose if you were rich, famous, well-off, um, and you wanted to be remembered for posterity, you would have your portrait painted. And that's the only way you could have been remembered. And all the rich merchants and um, politicians and people around Liverpool would have been having their portraits painted on a regular basis, I would imagine. And uh, Cornelius thought that he might uh, make his way in the world by being a portrait painter. He, he did do other things as well, actually. He did an awful lot of copies of famous paintings. Again, if it wasn't possible to um, produce paper prints of famous paintings and people wanted to have copies of it, then a man like Cornelius, who could sit down in a church and uh, make a copy of a famous painting on the wall, uh, could maybe make a living that way. And this is what he did. Uh, what we're looking at here on the screen uh, may be familiar to a lot of people. Uh, this is what we call the Half Seas Over birthday portrait this was joseph williamson's 50th birthday portrait and the reason for the name half seas over is because this painting eventually found its way into the um walker art gallery it's not on display and never has been but it's down there in the vaults and we were allowed to go and view it one time a few years ago and to photograph it and this is how we have this version of it which we're allowed to use uh, not commercially, but we can use it for our own ends. And um, on the back of this uh, portrait, when, when it was uh, found, there was a little sticker on the back saying that um, Williamson agreed that it could be sold for no less than five guineas because he considered to be a reasonable likeness of him when he was half seas over, which we are now convinced means when he was drunk. Just having his little joke, I think. But anyway, it's his 50th birthday portrait. Now, the funny thing is, it's um, it's listed by the Walk Art Gallery, along with paintings by Cornelius Henderson. But it isn't actually positively identified as a Cornelius Henderson painting. I firmly believe that it was painted by Cornelius, but we can't actually prove it. If you take a look at this portrait here, this one is by Cornelius Henderson, and it's a Dr. William Shepherd. And if you look at the two side by side, there are so many similarities about the way the sitter is portrayed, the way he's sitting, the hand on the table, the blurred background. They are so similar. 
And as this one is definitely by Cornelius Henderson, I think it's 99% certain that um, our 50th birthday portrait was by him because he was known to have painted uh, Joseph Williamson uh, on a number of occasions. And he was, uh, Joseph Williamson patronised him uh, greatly when he came to Liverpool. This one here, uh, I'm afraid I've got two, two uh, versions. Um, these are from... Um, a manuscript by the historian Charles Hand. So I only have copies from his manuscript in black and white. But this particular painting is definitely attributed to Cornelius Henderson, and it was painted in 1828. And uh, the next one is not attributed uh, definitely to Cornelius, but I believe it's also by him. And this one was painted in 1838, 10 years later. And at this point, Williamson was uh, 69. Uh, he died in 1840. So uh, 10 years on, just a couple of years before his death. I, I believe they're all painted by Cornelius Henderson. I think most people do. It's just they can't be positively attributed to him. Now, uh, Cornelius Henderson... Um, came to Liverpool in the early 1820s. Uh, he married his first wife, Elizabeth Warwick, in 1822. And uh, he lived in uh, Brownlow Hill for a while. But he came to the attention of Joseph Williamson, who thought he was a good artist, and he invited him to come and live in one of his houses in Smithdown Lane. Uh, so... I don't know when the paintings were done or how many he did, but he was obviously taken under the wing of Joseph Williamson, who thought he was thought he was a, a respectable artist and wanted to support him. Now, uh, there's a rather nice story. Um, I'm going to read you two two bits of two versions of it here. Uh, it is easy if I just read it out as it's been written down by the writer James Stonehouse, the local historian. Now. Um, he, he's written here in his book, The Streets of Liverpool, that at the corner of Bolton Street, it will be remembered by many that there was once a strange looking tall house of three stories, or rather two stories and a ground floor, having immensely long, large windows. Without stating his intention respecting this house, Williamson went on building it superintending its progress with great care and employing many men in the erection to expedite the work. On its being completed, he sent for Mr. Henderson, the artist, whom he much patronised. After giving him commissions for pictures, on that gentleman's arrival, he took him to the new building and after showing him the rooms, he told him that he had erected it purposefully for him to paint in. <laughs> Mr. Henderson astonished at this generous act, respectfully pointed out to his patron that the windows, as they were then constructed, were utterly useless to an artist who required only a top light. At this, Williamson flew into a violent passion, swore at Henderson, and charged him with ingratitude that he had built a house for him that had cost upwards of a thousand pounds, and after all, for nothing. Just at this moment, the Reverend Mr. Hull was seen passing along the street, when Williamson shouted, Hey, hello there, Parson Hull, come over here. On Mr. Hull joining them, Williamson said, Now look here, Parson, I built Henderson a house on purpose to paint in, and he says it's of no use to him. He's been talking a load of damn rubbish about top lights. Did you ever hear such nonsense? Here's light plenty for everything and anything, and yet he says it's of no use to him. Do you ever hear such utter nonsense? Parson Hull and Mr. Henderson endeavoured to appease the Roaring Lion and strove to explain to him how unnecessary was such an exuberance of light to a painter, but all to no purpose. He would not or could not understand, and the consequence was that the house was never occupied or used for any purpose. In fact, as a habitation, it was untenantable, there being no kitchen, scullery or any domestic conveniences whatsoever. It was a mere building consisting of three immense rooms, one over the other, with a deep basement or cellar. And that was the end of that. Now, just remember about the deep basement or cellar, 
because that's relevant later. In the next piece of writing by James Stonehouse, which is from another of his extracts from uh, his uh, manuscripts, um, he, he wrote many stories, James Stonehouse, and sometimes he wrote them over and over again, and different versions come out with slightly different wording, but all having pretty much the same effect. So in the second one from uh, one of his uh, uh, manuscripts, he says, the large square house at the corner of Bolton Street is a specimen of Mr. Williamson's constructive oddity. The rooms are numerous and very lofty, but there is no convenience usual to houses. It stands upon arches of great height. The piers are of solid stone. There is a tunnel or passage under the street which communicates with the house on the other side of the road, or rather the vaults under it. This house was built expressly for the late Mr. Henderson, the portrait painter, with whom Mr. Williamson was very intimate. He patronised Mr. Henderson on all occasions and befriended him at all times. After the house was completed, and this was done entirely without Mr. Henderson's knowledge of Mr. W's intentions respecting it, Mr. W could not be made to understand why the long windows he had put into it were useless to an artist. And on being told that they were so, his reply was, don't tell me such rubbish that a better light can be got from a poking skylight than from such windows as these of mine. So it caused a lot of aggravation between the two men. And he obviously thought that uh, um, Cornelius Henderson was being very unreasonable. Now, um, just read just a little bit in those two pieces of writing about deep vaults beneath the house that he had built for Mr. Henderson and the passage running under the street to the houses on the other side. Now then, moving forward. This is what eventually replaced the building that Joseph Williamson put up on that site for Mr. Henderson. And um, it's correct that that building stood empty and unused until about 1914, when it was finally demolished. After that, um, I'm not quite sure how much later, but um, the late teens or maybe into the early 20s, this row of houses here were built. Um, it is said in Mr. Stonehouse's writing that it was on the corner of Mason Street here and Bolton Street. This street now has been renamed and is now called Shimmin Street, but it's the same street. And this is the corner where there was a deep quarry. We know there was a deep quarry. Uh, it's uh, it's shown on uh, early maps and whether it was actually dug out by Mr. Williamson or whether it was partly there before he came along, we can't be sure, but he probably extended it. And he used this piece of land because it was his way to vault over it and then build on top. He's done this over and over. So uh, if we move forward to, uh, I'm not quite certain, I've not been able to uh, pin this down but either sometime in the 1980s or the early 1990s, these houses here, a pair of them here and another one just slightly set back on the terrace, uh, had become unsafe. They'd started to crack up. The walls were cracking and everything was on the move. Yes, why? Williamson's deep quarry underneath. So the people who lived in them had to be moved out. The houses were boarded up and they stayed like that for quite a number of years, I believe, until eventually they had to be demolished. This is the um, the end of uh, Shimin Street, Bolton Street as it was. And the two houses have been demolished here. And the third one is uh, due to be gone very shortly. And directly across the road, across Mason Street here from there, this was the uh, Merseyflex factory building, which... Uh, I've mentioned many times in my talks and on that land on the uh, west side of Mason Street should stood more houses put up by Joseph Williamson being numbers uh, 46 to 52 I believe uh, and the tunnel that run under the street from here would have run through to number 50 or 52. There's the third of the uh, three houses being separated from the rest of the row before finally being demolished, leaving the rest safe. And this is what it ended up looking like. Mason Street in the foreground, Shimin Street there. The council demolished the three buildings. They tarmacked over the piece of land, put a fence around it and walked away. 
And it's remained like that ever since. They haven't made any attempt to even consider putting more houses on top. They probably learned their lesson. They know better. The ground below there is too unstable and they ain't going to put any more houses up there. So that's what it looks like today. The rest of the row uh, are all still intact. A pair of houses at the far end of that uh, terrace corresponding to the two that were this end and then one further further back. And uh, coming up to date nearly, uh, we're now looking at a section of the army plan that we've used so much in searching for tunnels and trying to make sense of Williamson's underground network. This was uh, from the 1880s. This plot of land here is our Williamson house site, and that's where his house stood. The piece of land next door, this triangle here alongside the railway cutting, contained numbers 46, 48, 50, and 52. And right opposite is the piece of land where Williamson built this studio for Cornelius Henderson. Now, as you can see, this plan appears to show a large chamber there with a passage running alongside it, leading to a tunnel going right underneath Mason Street and then forking off in two directions on the other side of the street. In 2019, after the Mersey Flax factory was demolished, we got permission in that September to uh, go on the land and search for these things. And I've shown this before, but it's all part of this story as well. On the very first day of our week's dig, we dug down alongside adjacent to the pavement here on Mason Street and dug this trench, and we discovered that tunnel running under the street straight away. Absolutely first morning of the dig. We got the spot right, the army plan was correct, and there it is. That tunnel, or half a tunnel as it looks in the uh, at this end of it, is uh, completely filled up, and we didn't dare to touch any of that material. But uh, hopefully the complete tunnel is uh, intact, going right across the street to the, um, the deep uh, quarry cellar of the, um, the building that he put up for Cornelius Henderson on the other side of the street. He dragged away along this um, um, basement room or uh, passageway, uh, away from the road there and uh, that's as far as we got we then started digging in the other direction and found that big chamber which I've spoken about before but as you can see the tunnel there goes right across the street and on that side of Mason Street there is the plot of land where this studio stood so all that is quite true, even though it sounds like a really fantastic and silly story. Now, I want to bring a couple of other people into the story here. Two ladies, or uh, a lady and her daughter, Elizabeth Walton, and her young daughter, also named Elizabeth. They came to Liverpool in the early 1820s. Elizabeth Walton was the widow of a gentleman called Whitfield Walton. He was uh, quite a wealthy and successful timber merchant, uh, we believe, and he had uh, business interests in Liverpool and in Cumberland. Now, uh, Whitfield Walton died quite young. He had a family, uh, I believe he had five children, and he died in 1810. And um, he had plans for his children to inherit uh, various farm properties that he owned in Cumberland. And his, his youngest daughter, Elizabeth, was destined to become the owner of a farm called Rose Wen. Um, but we believe that all of his children, apart from Elizabeth, died quite young, and so they never inherited anything. He died much too young, and his wife, Elizabeth, inherited his whole estate. So she must have become a fairly wealthy woman. And she came to Liverpool in the early 1820s. Um, she moved into Mason Street uh, sometime in the early 1830s. And uh, we don't really know exactly what was going on. It's a rather intriguing story. I wish I knew more. But... Um, 
she seems to have become Joseph Williamson's housekeeper, although that doesn't really sound quite right in some ways, because as a wealthy woman, I, I don't believe that she needed to take on a job as a housekeeper. Maybe she didn't. Maybe she did certain housekeeping work for Joseph Williamson in exchange for other things, because she was a wealthy woman, but she didn't necessarily have any um, um, idea about business and, and property management. But of course, Joseph Williamson did. He was a very experienced businessman and owned lots and lots of properties. I believe Joseph Williamson probably took Elizabeth Walton under his wing and wanted to help her uh, with her property. And um, I'm only I'm only guessing here, but <coughs> excuse me. At some point in the early 1830s, Elizabeth Walton uh, has turned over Rosewen Farm to Joseph Williamson's ownership. I can't quite understand why that would happen, but it would have served a purpose for him. Owning a property in Cumberland would have given him a um, a vote in Parliament in that county. As a woman, Elizabeth Walton wouldn't wouldn't have had a vote, but Joseph Williamson inheriting a property up there would have got a vote, and that may have been of some significance to him. In exchange, he was acting perhaps as their business advisor, and perhaps she was acting as housekeeper for him. It's it's so difficult to know for sure. This is um, the will of Elizabeth Walton, which she drew up in um, early 1839. In fact, the 18th of January, 1839, in which she left all of her property to her daughter, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth was only... Um, 17 i think when they when they came to liverpool but um she was always destined to have uh rose Wen farm according to uh her father's wishes but everything else has now been um turned over to her in her mother's will and uh elizabeth walton died later that year leaving her daughter elizabeth to carry on as Joseph Williamson's housekeeper. Right, now then. We're not really quite sure what's going on here, but Joseph Williamson was a fit and healthy man for the whole of his life, and he lived to be 71. At the beginning of 1840, his final year, he was still fit and healthy. By the April of that year, in fact, by the 29th of April, I think he was seriously unwell and he might have realised that his end was getting close. Joseph Williamson had made uh, a fairly complex will, being a, a, a big property owner with lots of interests. And um, he'd also made three codicils to his will. And on the 29th of April, 1840, he made a fourth and final codicil to his will. Now, his will and the three codicils that came before were all professionally drawn up by his solicitors. He probably would have tootled off downtown to visit his solicitor and had this will drawn up, signed it, had it witnessed by uh, officials in the solicitor's office. But in this particular case, the will seems to have been um, written on a rather scruffy piece of paper like something torn out of a uh, an exercise book. And uh, it was in a rather scruffy handwriting, whether it's Joseph Williamson's himself or whether somebody wrote it down for him, uh, I wouldn't know. But it was quite scruffy and it was uh, quite rushed. And um, in this um, page from Charles Hand's manuscript, um, it says here, um, it, it gives the, the whole script of his final codicil, where he's bequeathing Rosewen Farm to Elizabeth Walton Jr. In fact, he's giving it back to the lady who was always intended to become the owner of Rosewen Farm. He also bequeaths a £100 annuity to his good friend, 
Cornelius Henderson. And that's his final, fourth and final codicil to his will. And in fact, you probably can't see it on the screen there, but the two um, witnesses to his will, it says here, are Francis Beatty, Edge Hill, Joiner, and John Corson, Joiner, Edge Hill. This is going to be two of Joseph Williamson's employees. So it looks like he's done this uh, codicil at home, perhaps on his deathbed, and just called in two of his employees to witness it. A very rushed job. And then just four days later, on the 1st of May, Joseph Williamson died. So he's managed to do the right thing right at the end of his life. In the nick of time, he's signed back the uh, Rosewen farm to young Elizabeth Walton, who was always destined to inherit it. And our people went up to uh, Cumbria um, a few years back to do a bit of research, and they came across this um, gatepost at Rosewen Farm. As you can see, the name's been changed. It was called Rosewen, W-E-N, in uh, w Williamson's day. It's now become Rose Wayne, and it's still there. The building is still there. I've seen photographs of it when it was up for sale. So um, quite an interesting um, bit of a story going on there between the, the Waltons and Joseph Williamson. I'd love to know all the ins and outs of it, but I don't suppose we'll, we'll ever know more. Um, another funny thing is that just a few months after um, Joseph Williamson died in May, 1st of May, 1840, um, Elizabeth Walton Jr. married Cornelius Henderson. And... Um, <laughs> By doing that, all her worldly goods would become his. Because in those days, when a woman married, all that she owned became the property of her husband. So now Cornelius Henderson has become a landowner, a property owner in Cum Cumberland, uh, and the owner of this farm, Rose Wen. And uh, presumably that entitled him to a vote in Cumberland. Um, he didn't keep it for very long. Uh, in 1845, he sold the farm. Maybe they sold the farm. Maybe he sold the farm. Uh, we can't possibly know. Uh, but the farm was sold. Uh, and yet the strange thing is that he he, he must have enjoyed being uh, a property owner uh, because he carried on calling himself uh, a property owner even after he'd sold the farm. Cornelius lived on until 1852. Uh, and... Uh, he died in October of that year. <clears throat> and this is a, um, a newspaper advert for a uh, an auction sale where um, his paintings in the following year, 18, uh, this is from the Liverpool Mail, February 1853. Uh, and um, there's an auction sale of some of his uh, paintings. Uh, quite a lot of paintings were uh, copies of uh, uh, religious works which may have been quite valuable. And he was presumably offering them to the uh, the public institutions, the uh, art galleries and the like. So um, they, they were all sold off. But um, uh, when, when he died, a lot of uh, his household goods, which were auctioned, um, bore a very similar likeness to the household goods uh, that Joseph Williamson left behind. But we know that uh, young Elizabeth Walton inherited all of those and probably took them with her when she went to live with, uh, when she married and went to live with Cornelius Henderson. So the same goods were being sold off after Cornelius's uh, uh, death, as were in Joseph Williamson's house. So um, sad end to the story really is that just a very short while after um, Cornelius Henderson died in 1852, uh, Elizabeth Walton Jr uh went rather suddenly blind and had to move away from mason street and was cared for by uh family members up in kirkdale and that's the last we know of her so um quite a quite a mixed story i, I really am quite intrigued by what the true relationship was between joseph williamson and these two ladies who came to live in Mason Street. I'm sure it was more than just a housekeeper relationship. 
But uh, I think he rather took them under his wing, perhaps because his own wife had died many years earlier and because he never had any children. And he could see that they needed help, um, not financially, but uh, help in administering their finances and their uh, their business dealings. Perhaps he took them under their, under his wing and uh, treated them a bit like a second family. Who knows? Again, as usual, it's all questions and not enough answers. So that's about uh, all I've got to show you on uh, the relationship between Joseph Williamson, Cornelius Henderson, and Elizabeth Walton, Senior and Junior. Thank you. <laughs>